Now, please welcome a conversation between Program Coordinator Smithsonian Movement of Light at the Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, Jared Steba, and the director, Giraffe Conservation Foundation, Julian Fennessy. people would not know it, but Niger is home to the last West African giraffe in the wild. There's none in any zoos around the world. They're right here. Les giraffes vivent avec la population. Le gouvernement du Niger a eu la présence d'esprit d'organiser la conservation de la protection. Et maintenant, elles se sont multipliées, ces girafes-là. All the eggs are in one basket, so to speak. If we set up new populations, satellite populations, just in case there's something going wrong, we can then have these populations that are safe and secure. in the right place. We've got the trailer ready, the tow hitch works finally, and we're ready to go. So each giraffe has been caught individually. We identify a giraffe which is suitable age, suitable sex. Dart it. It takes two or three minutes. Uh, the drug kicks in. Sometimes they'll go down quite quickly, sometimes they'll give us a bit of a run. At the right stage, we'll pull ahead of the giraffe and using the ropes, pull it down and, uh, and quickly give the antidote. Now, there's quite a lot of things we do with the giraffe. Check their age, take some measurements, take some blood samples for disease work, etc., etc. animals here, three males and five females. They settle on remarkably well, I mean particularly these giraffe because they're so used to people. We've just taken giraffe for approximately 48 hours to Gadabaji Game Reserve. It's the first release ever of West African giraffe in the wild. This is the start of something big for this population. Thanks, guys. And now to talk Rays of Hope Africa, or Julian Fennessy, the co-founder and co-director of the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, and Jared Stavik, ecologist and program coordinator for the Smithsonian's Movement of Life. Thank you both for being here and for showing us that incredible film. It's really quite jaw-dropping to hear that giraffe have been extirpated from parts of Africa. And I think a lot of people watching are probably shocked at that revelation as well. But at the same time, it's also inspiring and hopeful to see the work GCF is doing to recover the species. 
Can you both talk about the threats to giraffe? And Julian, how does this translocation process work as a solution? Thanks, Kat. It's, uh, it's great to be here. It's great to share some of the success stories we've been doing across Africa and Niger itself is, is truly one of them. You know, the numbers of giraffe were down to 49 individuals in the mid 1990s and are now booming. They're over 600 and, and, you know, we've had lots of threats, you know, human population growth is massive, you know, linked with that, we've got development needs of, of local communities, but also governments. And so we've had to find new populations uh, to set up and in Niger, uh, we found an area that giraffe used to be, you know, many, many years ago and uh, went about uh, finding the best solution to, to move them and set up these satellite populations. And it, it's not the first time uh, that we've done it, but uh, we've been able to work closely with uh, the government of Niger first to develop national strategies, figure out what the solutions are. And one of those is the translocation and, and linked to that is, is figuring out how to monitor these things, how to, you know, when these animals get there, how to we see where they're going and what they're doing. And, you know, that's where our partnership with SCBI and Jared in particular comes in handy. And uh, maybe Jared can have a little talk about this little thing here. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the little tracking device that Julian is showing, we call it the, the Asacone tag. Um, so this is the, the newest generation of tracking devices that we're using to try to understand the spatial ecology. So where giraffe are moving, how much space do they need, um, where are the key connections. Um, it's a device that you know, we mount directly to the ossicone or horn-like protrusion of the giraffe. Um, and it's a device that's solar powered and it's providing in many cases anywhere from one to two to three years worth of data. Um, so really from a scientific pr perspective, that really is the gold that we need to inform conservation on the ground, right? So um, we're now working directly with Julian and Draft Conservation Foundation and establishing Twiga Tracker. So it's a continent-wide strategy to understand movement across all four of the different giraffe species, from Niger all the way down to Namibia, South Africa. And Julian, do you want to tell us a little bit more about these transcontinental efforts? No, for sure. So we're quite lucky as the Giraffe Conservation Foundation to uh, be the only organization working across the continent on giraffe conservation and management. Uh, at the moment, we're supporting and undertaking work in 15 African countries, everything from counting how many giraffe are there, looking at the threats, human-wildlife conflict, which is really surprising because most people wouldn't think giraffe can be a problem, but they do like to eat food and steal that from people's mangoes and uh, their crops, um, all the way through to translocations and GPS satellite tagging. As, as Jared said, Twigger Tracker, we put on more than a couple of hundred GPS satellite units on giraffe over the last couple of years and, you know, by far the biggest program for giraffe out there. And we are pretty good at understanding what's happening with giraffe uh, and how to manage them, how to capture them, what to do with them. But the science side is where we needed an, a really good partnership. And, you know, that's where we contacted Jared and SCBI to uh, say, how can you help us? And, you know, we're fortunate enough to have an amazing partnership. We've got a postdoc in Dr. Michael Brown working with us, but, uh, Jared's the clever one, and hopefully he can maybe explain a little bit more about the science and the value in it. Yeah, well, I, I think that's quite kind of you, Julian. Um, I think it really is a true partnership. You know, we are a US-based institution. Um, we do have a number of individuals in our quantitative lab that are developing the techniques to, to better understand movement. Um, but again, we're U.S. based, and so we need partnerships as well. And so I think, you know, all the items that GCF and Julian are doing with local governments, with local stakeholders, you know, coming up with the conservation strategies for where we want, what we want to happen across these landscapes with agreement with the governments, you know. So Julian started off the conversation basically saying, you know, the government of Niger is behind these activities. And so I think that's hugely important, as well as the, the local community members that are, um, that are across those landscapes 
that GCF and their team members are working with. So I think I think this really does highlight a true collaboration to really get to where we want to be, and and that really is we are not going to say, not not going to agree to having any animals uh, populations go extinct, um, and we really want to stop that from happening. And Julian, working with governments and having different threats, are there any other challenges? that you all face at GCF trying to do this work and get to these solutions? No, there's no doubt, you know, there's a challenge every day and obviously we're in the midst of one of the most crazy times at the moment, wherever we are in the world. And, you know, a lot of our teams are obviously not able to be on the ground, but we're fortunate enough to have um, some veterinarians out in northern Uganda. We've got a team up in northwest Namibia. So we're able to get through some of these challenges, but it's really trying to figure out the whole society, culture, um, you know, how we work in each of these countries differs. And, and that's why over the years we figured out what we think might be the best solution. And uh, as Jared says, that's through partnerships. You know, it's not just GCF out there. We're working and we develop um, MOUs or agreements with many governments across Africa, lots of NGOs on the ground, but also internationally. Um, it really is a team effort and, uh, you know, conservation, we say, you know, can't be just done by GCF uh, if it's to save giraffe before it's too late. And, you know, sometimes it's really hard and, uh, you know, we don't like to admit it, but it's about conservation successes and, and we really think we are making a difference and uh, we wouldn't do it if we didn't think we were making a difference. And I just know the other day we had Jared out in the field and it was awesome to see him come and help capture a few giraffe with us. Yeah, I guess I would say I think it's the most amazing thing that I've ever been involved with. You know, I mean, it's a bit frightening when you see it on the video, but we have to remember that these are really, really tough animals. And so even though like, they are crashing to the ground so that we can put this device on them, they do get up really quickly. You know, it's a 2,000, 3,000 pound animal and they are really tough. So I think it's really encouraging what's going on across the continent, you know, really being led by GCF and, and team members. Well, that's all the time we have, but I'd like to thank you both for joining me and being a part of Earth Optimism. And for those watching that want to find out more, please follow Giraffe Conservation Foundation on Twitter at save underscore giraffe and movement of life at Smithsonian MOL. Thank you both. Thanks, Kat.